Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Axios reporter Steph Kite and her panel. Yes, I'm Steph Kite, and I'm a reporter from Axios, where I cover demographics and immigration. And yes, I'm one of those millennials that you were just hearing about. So I'm very happy to be here talking about these important topics with all of you. And I'm especially grateful to be here with this wonderful panel that I want to take a minute to introduce. So here we have next to me Bill Fry from the Brookings Institution. And next to him, Heather Hahn, a senior fellow at the Urban Institute. And beside her, we have Philip Jefferson, who is a professor of economics at Swarthmore College. And last but not least, Margaret Spellings, a senior consultant at Texas 2036 and the former secretary of the Department of Education. So thank you all for being here. So there are a lot of changes happening in this country. In just the past 20 years, uh, the iPhone came into existence. Donald Trump both premiered on The Apprentice and is now President of the United States. Um, we no longer have the Twin Towers and Brexit is a thing, just in the past 20 years. And now we're looking at the next 20 to 30 years and we're expecting even more significant changes to what we look like as Americans, uh, what we believe and where we spend our money. And to kick us off, I'd love to have Bill Fry, who has spent a lot of time researching and writing about these topics, um, run through some of the most significant trends that we're watching in the U.S. Yeah. Well, thanks, Steph. Uh, I have an admission to make. I'm not an economist. I know that a lot of people here are economists. I'm a demographer. I'm going to talk about demographics in the U.S. and the big picture of demographics in the U.S. And I think uh, the main theme is that we're getting older, but the younger part of our population is becoming much more racially diverse. And I think that's something people don't keep in mind. And that's going to be the theme for a couple of the slides that I'm going to present. Uh, one thing I think people should understand is that we're getting older as a country. And last year, we had the lowest rate of growth in the United States that we've had in over 80 years. Um, as we move into the middle part of this century, we're going to be even less, growing even less, uh, less fast. And we have to keep that in mind. And one of the reasons we're, re probably the main reason we're growing so slowly is we're aging rapidly. Older people die more. And as we move into the future, we're going to have a, a higher rate of deaths or more people dying. Fertility declining just a little bit. Uh, and immigration is what's keeping us growing at all, probably after the next decade or so. Uh, but to sort of to sort of uh, put, accentuate this, let's put a, th put a slide up and show you some of the growth trends. The next slide. We can uh, and what we can see here is uh, for four decades, between 2010 and 2050, the decade growth for different age groups, children, working age population, and seniors. And what sticks out at you is the very fast growth of seniors. In the decade that's just about to end, seniors will have increased by almost 40%. Uh, that's the baby boomers moving into the 65 and over population. That's the first half of the baby boomers. The second half of the baby boomers are going to move in in the next 10 years, and that's that growth in 30%. But even 30 years out and 40 years out, the senior population, the older population, is going to be growing much faster than the working age of the child population. So as we look ahead into the future, we're going to be talking about age dependency rather than child dependency, which is what we've been thinking about before. Now, I think the next piece of this, which I think most people don't really realize as much, is that interacts with diversity, the age interaction with diversity. I wrote this book called Diversity Explosion, which you could get from Brookings Institution Press. And one of the best, uh, most important uh, charts in that book, <coughs> the most important charts that I think we should think about in the future of the United States, is the growth of minority populations, racial minorities. The three bars at the right side of this chart are what I call new minorities, Hispanics, Asians, people of two or more races. Over the next 45 years, those groups are going to almost double or triple in size. In fact, those groups together accounted for 80% of the growth in the United States since 2000. The two other minority groups, blacks and American Indians or Alaskan Natives, will also grow, but not nearly as fast as the new minorities. And on the left side of the chart, you'll see that the white population over that period of time will be declining. In fact, the Census Bureau says that after the year 2024, we're going to have an absolute decline in our white, our non-Hispanic white population. Since 2000, we've actually seen a decline in the 
youthful white population, that is the underage 18 white population has declined. More whites, more young whites have, have graduated to above 18 than have been born or immigrated into the United States because of this aging population. And in the next 10 years, we're going to see a decline in whites who are age 20 something. And in the next 20 years, we're going to see a decline in whites who are age 30 something. The only, the only part of the white population that's going to be growing in the near term and in the longer term is the 65 and over population. And this is going to be an accentuated aging of the white population. Now, when you put these two things together, the aging of the population and the very severe aging of the white population and the high diversity, what you're going to get is a age profile of the United States. This is the race profile of different age groups going from zero to nine to 70 and over. This is what we're going to see in the 2020 census probably. And that is the under 10 population will be minority white. The 10 to 19 population will be about half white. And then the millennial population, which will be in the late 20s and 30s during that period, they, they I think, are the bridge generation. They're 44% minority. And they're the bridge between the largely white older population and the more diverse younger population. So the picture that I've tried to paint for you here is what's going on in the US is a rapidly growing older population, a very tepidly growing younger population. But all of the future growth in the young working <coughs> age population and then the youth population will be coming for racial, racial minorities. And that's good, perhaps, but it's not so good. Let's move to this next slide. When we look at the disparities between racial groups among this young generation, this looks at the percent college graduates by race. And you can see that Asians and whites have a higher rate of college graduation than Latinos and blacks. When you think at the future generations going into those years, they're going to be at least 40% Hispanics and blacks. This says that we have a lot of work to do. I could show similar slides to show the home ownership disparities by race for the younger generation, or child poverty for the younger generation. And if you think that getting a post-secondary education will help you improve your earnings over, life, over your lifetime, which economic studies show, or that owning a home will help improve your uh, wealth uh, accumulation over time, then if we look at this younger generation and this sharp racial disparity, in all these socioeconomic measures says that we have a lot of work to do if we're going to count on these younger generations to help build our labor force, our tax base, our consumer base. And it means we need to have policies that focus like a laser beam on things like education, uh, workforce, child, uh, child care, uh, stuff like that. And I would have to say that if we look at our politics today, our very divided politics today, this is not a top priority that we see. I think we have very much a kind of a racial and generational identity politics kind of thing going on, where the older, largely white population is worried about their taxes, not worried about paying uh, for generations who they don't see as their children or their grandchildren. Political writer Ron Brownstein writes about this, and he calls it about the disparity between the gray and the brown, and he uses that as a lens to analyze a lot of the presidential and local elections that we've seen in the last two, three, four years across the United States. And what I think is that if we don't close this cultural generation gap, is what I like to call it, we're going to be in difficulty. And I think if you just look at the projected <coughs> eligible voter population, here is a comparison between 2016 and 2018 in the size of the eligible voter population and in the racial profiles of the eligible voter population for different age groups. Certainly for the younger age groups, the eligible voter population becomes more racially diverse, gets a little bigger. But I want you to focus on those two bars at the right. Those are the sizes of the eligible voter population from age 65 and over between 2016 and projected to 2018. It's a group that turns out to vote a lot. And when you see that group there and you see that they may still be, have some difficulty with investing in our diverse youth that we're seeing today in our politics, both local and national, it's going to be a difficult time. So I'm not as optimistic as I was maybe four or five years ago that we were going to come, <coughs> come together in all this. I really do think we have a generational codependency. Investing in our racially diverse younger population in, orbital, over, in order to, over the longer term, be able to have them improve their own economic circumstances, but also contribute to the older population, social security trust funds, to Medicare, and all of those sort of things. That's what we really need is people to understand that. We need leaders national, local, state level leaders in corporate communities and in, in the political environment 
to make this kind of demographic case, and I don't see it as much as I think we should, uh, but at least I'm hopeful that uh, maybe in another five, ten years, people will come to see this as what we need to do as a top priority. So that's my demographic story. Thank you, Bill. That is fascinating. We have a lot to unpack here, and I promise we will spend time kind of going through each of these trends and, and getting insight from our other panelists on why these matter. Um, first, so we're going to take a look at a poll that we um, ask all of you all to answer, asking what you think the trends are that are going to have the biggest impact on our economy. So can we take a look at the question three polling question? So climate change to all of you is what you think will have the, the biggest impact over on the economy in the US, followed by artificial intelligence, and then income inequality, and then changing demographics. And I'd love to get some reactions from some of our panelists. Perhaps, Heather, you'd like to start off. What, what would you have chosen uh, given, <coughs> given this question? And are you surprised by these answers? Um, these, are, these really do give some, some food for thought. Um, but I think they're really interconnected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think uh, the, as Bill was saying about the um, political environment and um, uh, a sense of racial and age identity, that those issues, th that, that um, view of the world affects how we view these other issues um, and how we might approach issues of climate change and so forth. Margaret, do you want to re react to that? I, I, if you ask people in Texas, they would say income inequality and changing demographics. As you know, we're a giant oil and gas state down there, so maybe a little less interest in, or a little less emphasis on climate change. But I agree, they're interrelated. Yeah. Well, if you look over uh, the past few decades, what's been very important in the U.S. economy has been technological change and globalization. Mm -hmm. And these are factors that have had uh, a great impact on uh, income inequality. So I would view some of these um, uh, uh, measures that you're looking at here is sort of outcomes. So changing demographics also has to do with globalization, the increased mobility of people and capital around the world. And income inequality is a result of a changing return to skills based on uh, in ex the expansion of trade and uh, with respect to the introduction of new technologies that uh, benefit people with certain skill sets relative to others. So let's start going through some of these big trends that Bill spent some time walking us through. And starting off with the aging population in the U.S., as he mentioned, we're going to see um, the number of people over 65 surpass the number of people who are under the age of 18 just in the next uh, several years, which is significant change and has impacts in the way we spend our money. Um, and so first, Heather, I want to know, um, does per capita government spending always rise as populations get older? Well, so I think that um, right now, um, per capita, the federal government spends $6 for every senior compared to $1 um, for every child. Um, and w when we're looking across the generations and looking at how much we spend on each pe people of different ages, I think we need to keep in mind the needs of different ages. They certainly do change over time and the costs associated with those. Um, so this, um, this six to one ratio in federal funding, when we add in the state and local, because states and localities actually pay the majority of um, public spending on children, it's two to one. But it's still two dollars for every senior um, compared to one dollar per child. Part of that reflects our national priority that we made um, decades ago about supporting seniors and reducing elder poverty, which was a really important thing to do and has been effective. There's more to do there, but it has been effective. The other thing that contributes to that, uh, and my colleague Jean Sturley, who I, I see is here, will make this point um, very strongly, is that part of why we are spending more on seniors than on children is because of the budget policy that makes those payments automatic. Those, as, as health care costs rise and as um, senior costs rise, those payments are automatic. Spending on children often has to be negotiated each year. Um, and so 
as those, uh, so Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and interest on the debt are the only areas that are growing in the future, and spending on seniors is, is a big part of that. That growth in spending on seniors is squeezing out everything else. So investments in children, but investments in everything else as well. So I think that's something we need to keep in mind. I'm wondering if any of the rest of you would like to comment on that. How Are you expecting us to just have to pay for um, a growing elderly population? And, and how do you balance that with the need to invest in the younger generations, as Bill was talking about? Well, one of the things that I think is surprising, having been involved in public policy for a long time at the state and the federal level, is how little we know about these giant enterprises. Uh, Texas has just passed a 20, $250 billion biennial budget, that's big by any measure, and uh, we at Texas 2036 have assembled more than 300 publicly available data sets that we're now trying to use the era of big data to be smarter about government. But when you think about it, we don't have a plan for our $250 billion investment in Texas. It's just sort of this random, the piggies come to the trough at the legislature and we, you know, duke it out. And so I, I think bringing big data to bear on public policy so people understand you know, how are we really spending our, our resources? Heather's just given the, our, some, some good examples on the six to one and the two to one. But I think those are not well known and understood by the public generally. And when you start to say, where should our first dollar <coughs> investments be? People get it. We uh, just invested uh, $11.5 billion in public education in Texas in a very bipartisan way. And I think people see, Bill, to your point, that you know, we have storm clouds on the offing, and if we don't get our act together, uh, you know, we're not gonna live in a very prosperous place. I would simply add to this that when you think about spending on seniors, what's really important from the fiscal perspective is our capacity to, to pay for that spending. And what that depends on, crucially, is the number of workers that are in the economy of, of, uh, who are working age and very productive and paying into the systems that we use to support senior citizens. So in this regard, there are two things that matter, the number of young people working and their productivity. So this is where spending on the young becomes very important because we have to come to understand that spending as investment in our future workforce. And so funds allocated there will pay for themselves, if you will, because those people will grow up to be productive adults, they'll pay into the system, and allow us to uh, uh, finance the spending uh, that we're making on seniors. And given that we will rely on a young workforce in the future to, to help pay for the costs of a retired generation, how concerned are all of you with the falling fertility rates that we've seen over and over again? And what do you propose as a solution that will be necessary to ensure long-term economic growth? I think we do need to invest in all of our children. Um, and the, right now, the, if we stay on our current course under current law, spending on children is projected to decline over the next decade. It's been declining already for most of the, the past decade. Uh, it's about 9% of federal spending now. It's going down to under 7% of federal spending in 2028. Um, and so I think thinking about the investment in children and what that gets us in return is a really critical question. And thinking about investing in all of our children. Um, we know, uh, as I mentioned, the um, states provide two-thirds of the public support for children primarily through K through 12 education. And we know that differences in state spending are associated with differences in children's outcomes. Um, what we see now is that uh, states in the Northeast tend to spend more on children. States in the South and the West tend to spend less on children. And populations are growing in the South and the West where there's historically been that smaller investment. They're shrinking. Um, in the states that have historically had the higher investment. So if we continue these, these trends, they are all leading us to less investment in our children, which um, is the opposite direction that we need to be going. And, and why we need to bring yeah. you know, facts to bear and information to bear. I, we in Texas are certainly not looking to the federal government to solve our 
issues around youth, given the, the mix, funding mix that you just mentioned. So uh, I, I think this is where, I mean, this kind of information, this kind of forum uh, has to be more uh, you know, broadly distributed to the folks. I'm glad I live in a place that's growing uh, and that's getting more diverse and that has a very well-developed uh, uh, and diverse population in terms of business community and so forth. So I'd rather be in Texas than Mach Massachusetts, I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, I probably wouldn't be invited there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to throw in that uh, one of the points that I tried to make is that uh, this younger generation is much more racially diverse than has ever been the case before. And there are still very sharp disparities in the opportunities for these young people, the kinds of public schools they go to, the kinds of availability of childcare that may be available to their parents. So it's not just so much should we have more children because the fertility rate is declining, but what we do, what are we doing with the children that we have, given that's a different demographic than we've ever seen before. And I think that's something we need to keep on the, on the top of our consciousness, too. Yeah. And when we look at these changing demographics, when we look at a future where the U.S. is minority, non-Hispanic, white, um, some people take this and, and become fearful. And we've seen people kind of spin this narrative in a negative way. What do each of you say to those people? Maybe start with you, Margaret, because Texas is already minority, non-Hispanic, white. How do you address those, um, those concerns that this is something bad? Yeah, it's a huge asset for us and why we you know, are often ranked at or near the top on economic growth, wage growth, whatnot. Not, not spread well enough across the spectrum, but, um, and as I say, you know, with 1,200 miles of border with Mexico, obviously we're the, the front door, the back door of the United States of America. And, you know, our growth has been because of international and domestic immigration because of the kind of business climate that we've created there. And we get that the coin of the realm is how well we develop human capital and that we have to raise expectations that we're going to invest and it's possible and morally right to educate all children to high levels. And, and we're going to work hard at doing that. Yeah. Well, I think it's the case that uh, a lot of the fear and concern that we see uh, with respect to the changing population has to do with the uh, perception that, uh, there, that the differences uh, between new populations or new minorities, to use the term, versus uh, traditional ones will somehow uh, impact uh, traditional populations in a negative way. And so there's this view that there's a substitutability between uh, uh, what was done before, particularly in the labor force, versus uh, what is going to happen now with a more diverse population. Now, I would put forth the argument that uh, diversity is complementary to uh, uh, what has come before, and that uh, particularly as new populations come into the uh, economy, uh, they have skills that complement those of natives, and that as a result of that, um, uh, traditional populations can actually be more productive, uh, and therefore this can be a net benefit uh, to society in the labor market and beyond. So given, given these two trends, that the aging of the population and, and the changing um, racial makeup of the U.S., um, how, how do you expect this to play out in, in politics and elections and among um, the demographic that we know will be voting? How are you going to convince the older white voters that it's important to invest in these young people's education? How, how does that come together? And what needs to be done to, to ensure that that point is understood? Um, can I back up to your question about um, this trend of um, being fearful of, a, of the U.S. becoming minority white? I mean, for directly to that issue of becoming fearful of a U.S. becoming minority white, I just have to say, get over it, right? <laughs> um, but if, if the issue is really about um, the trends that Bill was showing, continuing, uh, where if your race and ethnicity is a predictor of your outcomes and your well-being, that's the problem we have to solve. Not the racial demographic mix, but the problem that your race and ethnicity affects your outcomes. So we need to address the underlying structural racism that creates these outcomes. Uh, and that, I think, is the, the answer to your next question, too, 
Um, but it's a very difficult one because to do that, we, we really have to have the political and the social will to do that. Um, and I see that as the, I think the younger generation, because they are um, themselves more diverse and have more exposure um, to people who aren't exactly like them, that that helps to, to mitigate that. The older generation, I don't know, what do others think? <laughs> how, do we, how do we help that? You're <laughs> Bill will speak on behalf of okay. all of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I just want to pick up on this too. And I, you know, I think that the, it's, it's an overstatement of thinking that all older whites have this kind of mentality, even though I said that in my True enough. I think, I, think, I think it gets encouraged by politicians. I think particularly right now, it's getting encouraged by a lot of politicians, not just the President of the United States, but a lot of other politicians. And it's probably not as real as maybe the media might think. And it, it's also, I think, that when you look at the population, it's clearly the, the people that have this attitude tend to be older rather than younger, the people who kind of think the diversity of this country is putting it in the wrong direction and changing our culture and values and all of this sort of thing. But the people who are most likely to think this are people who are living in parts of the country that aren't very diverse, that are not experiencing the benefits of this diversity. They tend to be in smaller towns and rural areas and middle parts of the country and uh, sort of older parts of the population. And, and as we found in states like Texas or California or places like that, those kinds of attitudes aren't as strong. And my feeling is that over time, uh, it's an often used phrase, demography is destiny. Yeah. Uh, and demography certainly doesn't uh, you know, determine destiny, but it shapes it pretty well. And I think as we see these ships going across the country, uh, maybe those kinds of divides will, will fall apart. But it's not there now, and I think we have some work to do to to create this message so people understand the importance, not only to market, not because the diverse, to, to deal fairly with people of different racial and ethnic groups is the right thing to do, but it's the way that, that we can survive as a country. Can, can I pick up on that yeah. quickly? And I know you all get sick of hearing Texans talk about Texas, but anyway. <laughs> but it's an excellent case study, and that is everybody has followed the famous Beto O'Rourke, Robert Francis O'Rourke. And, um, and who got within a hair's breadth of beating Ted Cruz. And because he got that close, uh, lots of changes happened in the state legislature, in our congressional delegation, et cetera. <clears throat> and a, we have, have had no statewide elected Democrat in Texas for a long time. Well, this scared the you-know-what out of the statewide electeds, so much so uh, who see this demographic shift that our very conservative lieutenant governor called for a $5,000 across the board teacher pay increase. That ultimately did not happen, but teachers got a big pay raise. $11.5 billion investment in public schools, more than $1,000 more per kid, uh, et cetera. And so I, I do think our politicians can and do and will take signals uh, when people go to the polls and, and vote with their feet. We're going to transition to looking at another poll result and look at kind of what you all think we need to be doing, what should be a priority moving forward. And I just want to also remind everyone that if you have questions, um, to, to text them to the number on the screen, 22333, and I will leave, leave a few minutes to address some of your questions. Um, but could we take a look at the, the question four poll results? So which of the following policy goals is most important as we prepare for America's changing demographics? Um, and it looks like there was a tie for increased investment in education, infrastructure, and research, which is something we have all talked about, and transform the economy to adapt to automation and technological change. Um, I wonder if any of you have any other reactions to these results. Do you agree with, with our audience? It's all the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah all the same yeah. thing. <laughs> So uh, then I have a question. So if, if we all, you all have talked a lot about investing in education, and if we are to be investing more in education in our communities, where should that, where should those funds be coming from? Is there something that we should be, be cutting? Um, how do you address that? Where should this money be coming from to invest in the education of our young and more diverse generations? Well, again, I think most states, most governors, are, you know, do not understand, you know, if you had to force rank your priorities of investments <coughs> in your state budget, how would they look? And some of it's accidental vis-a-vis -vis federal policy and requirements and things that just drive on. But one, one of the things I think we in the policy arena can do is bring more facts together and show, you know, we say we're for education above all. You certainly have. I agree. 
uh, is that where we put our, do we put our money where our mouths are? And so I think that's, that's what groups like this can and should try to do and what we're trying to do at Texas 2036. Well, you know, I would make the argument that particularly at the state and local level, it is worthwhile uh, investing in uh, particular neighborhoods. Research has shown that uh, within the state and local communities, there are particular neighborhoods where there's concentrated pockets of poverty, and it has been persistent over time. And so I think a very valuable investment that is worth raising revenue for via taxes and other means is to raise funds to attack the neighborhoods uh, and geographical areas where the poverty has been persistent uh, over time. And in doing that, you can have impact, uh, uh, not only uh, in the short term, but we know that the benefits of uh, lifting children out of poverty at an early, uh, early age persist uh, going forward in terms of educational attainment and lifetime earnings. And so that's the type of return on investment we would want from public money. Awesome. Yeah. All right. I have rapid response questions, so be prepared. <laughs> uh, what, when you look at the next 20 to 30 years, what is most concerning to you and what makes you the most optimistic? I know that that's a big question, but if someone would be brave enough to, to go first. I'll go first. Okay. The thing that's most concerning to me is the inability of our political process to deal with big problems. The thing that I'm most optimistic about is that there is a generation of young people who are being raised in a more multicultural environment, who are energetic and smart, and that I believe will save us from ourselves. <laughs> I have almost the same answer. Um, so I think our polarization is, is the thing that is most concerning to me because these are big problems and to solve real problems, we need compromise, we need creative solutions. Um, everybody's gotta give a little bit and it's hard. And when to do that, we have to realize that we're in this together. And I do think that uh, young people uh, may recognize that togetherness more. And as long as we are polarized, um, we're not going to be able to come together and make those hard choices and those compromises that are absolutely necessary. I, I, I would say, I mean, I think, you know, it, we're, we've got an old, old versus young set up, and right now old people are winning. And uh, we're going to have to change that, and it's going to make some hard decisions. And we're going to have to raise ages and do things like that to curtail some of this because it's going to eat the, the, the cabbage that ate the United States government if we're not careful, and we're already there. So that's what I worry about. I'm optimistic because I think uh, politicians and policymakers, when you're presented with the facts, I mean, they're immutable, and they deserve solutions, and I think we're going to see them across the aisle. I mean, it, we're, we're on the cutting edge of it, and as I just said, it happened like that. We went from talking about transgender bathrooms to investing $11.5 billion in public education. All I can just say is ditto to what these <laughs> folks have said. I mean, I do think that the current political environment is not the best, particularly given the demography that we're facing. Maybe it's the demography that created it. I don't know. But I think when we get through more election cycles, I always like to say that uh, politicians are the best demographers. They know how to count the votes. And when that shifts, I think that's going <laughs> to change it yeah. in a good way for uh, the younger generation. Awesome. All right, well, I got one question from the audience that I'll pose since we have a tiny bit of time left. Um, many young adults delay or put off having children altogether because of unaffordable child care. Do you believe a substantial federal investment in early childhood programs would help slow the aging of America's population? And how would that transform our fiscal picture? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, since we're looking at the long term, I mean, one possibility is to shift uh, public policy towards a more pronatal uh, uh, stance. And, uh, you know, that, that could be a, a good thing. I think that investing in child care is important, not just for um, encouraging people to have children, but more so for supporting the people, um, no matter how few children you have, so that you can go to work. And I think that um, child care policy can help 
with the income inequality issues. Um, so uh, m many of the working poor, m many of the people who are living in poverty are working, um, but are in and out of jobs, um, partly because of the jobs themselves are unstable, but also because of the mismatch between the availability and affordability of childcare, as well as transportation, um, that makes it difficult to keep those jobs. So I think childcare is an uh, incredibly important part of the answer, but not necessarily for, for related to birth rates. Awesome. Anyone else? No? All right, well, thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, all of you, for sharing your expertise. Enjoy the rest of your day.